I've always had the ability to find myself in places where the map ends and the wilderness begins. My home is one of those dots on the map that you'd miss if you blinked. Nestled in the mountains, it's a town so small that calling it a town feels like an overstatement. We're a hundred souls, give or take, and I've only ever laid eyes on about a fifth of them. I recently landed a job in a city that requires a drive through winding mountain roads, a journey that's as treacherous as it is isolating. The road is a mess, potholes the size of craters, stretches of uneven pavement that'll rattle your bones and no shoulder to speak of, just ditches and steep drops that make you wonder if anyone would ever find you if you went over. And then there's the wildlife, raccoons, possums, coyotes, and deer. They saunter across the road like they own it, turning my 30-minute commute into a 40-minute obstacle course. Tonight, as I prepared for work, my ADHD was acting up worse than a rattlesnake in a heat wave. I was all over the place, scattered, unfocused, a whirlwind of half-finished tasks. My work uniform, soaking in the washer, my coffee, cold and forgotten, my eggs, burning in the pan while I stared at them, lost in a maze of thoughts. I finally managed to pull myself together. Uniform in the dryer, I sat down to a meal of cold coffee and slightly burnt eggs. My phone was in my hand, and I found myself doom-scrolling through social media, another rabbit hole that I couldn't afford to fall into. But I did. Time slipped away like sand through my fingers. Finally, I snapped out of it. I put on my shoes, hoping the worst of my scatterbrain was behind me. I tossed the dishes into the sink, grabbed my keys, and headed out the door. I knew I had to be careful. Spacing out at home was one thing, but on that road? A momentary lapse could mean hitting a deer or worse, driving off a cliff. I sat in my car, gripping the steering wheel, trying to collect my thoughts. I'd seen some meditation techniques on TikTok, yeah, TikTok of all places, and figured it was worth a shot. I closed my eyes, took deep breaths, and focused on the here and now. When I felt like I had a grip, I started the car and eased out of the driveway. Driving with full attention was a revelation. I noticed houses I'd never seen, churches that had blended into the background, even a rock quarry that was news to me. It was like driving down a brand new road and for a moment I felt good, I felt in control, but then it hit me. My uniform, it was still in the dryer. I'd been so focused on the road, so wrapped up in not screwing up, that I'd forgotten the one thing I absolutely needed for work. And just like that, my newfound focus shattered into a million pieces. The realization hit me like a bullet. My uniform was still in the dryer, warm and forgotten. I'd been so hell-bent on keeping my focus on the road that I'd let the most crucial detail slip through the cracks. The irony wasn't lost on me. I'd mastered the road but failed the basics. I was about halfway to work, and the clock was ticking. My options were limited either show up to work out of uniform and face the consequences, or turn back home and risk being late. I chose the latter. I had about five minutes of driving before I could safely turn around, and that's when I approached Evans, a small town that was more of a blip on the map than a community. Evans had always been my favorite part of the drive. It was a flat stretch of road surrounded by tree-covered mountains, a stark contrast to the winding uphill battle I usually faced. It reminded me of where I grew up, flat as a pancake but comforting in its simplicity. Evans was the only place to turn around after leaving my house, and as I drove into its boundaries, I felt a sense of calm wash over me. But that calm was short-lived. My mind started to drift again, replaying the events of the evening, cursing myself for forgetting my uniform. Before I knew it, I was pulling into a small mechanic shop at the edge of Evans. It was the only place to turn around, and I figured I could also take a moment to refocus. I parked the car and sat there, gripping the wheel tightly. My mind was a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces, and I needed to find them before I could move forward. I closed my eyes and took deep breaths, mimicking the TikTok meditation techniques that had worked earlier. After a few minutes, I felt like I'd regained some semblance of control. I started the car and made the U-turn, mentally berating myself for the oversight, but grateful for the chance to correct it. As I drove back, my mind kept circling back to that mysterious hill I'd passed earlier. How had I never noticed it before? Was my attention that fragmented? The hill seemed to beckon, a dark enigma that I couldn't shake off. But I pushed the thought aside, 
I had more immediate concerns, like making it to work on time. I was almost home when I saw it. The rock quarry, the churches, the houses that had caught my attention earlier. But this time they seemed less significant, overshadowed by the looming presence of that hill. It was as if the landscape had shifted, rearranging itself to highlight its most unsettling feature. I pulled into my driveway, rushed inside and grabbed my uniform from the dryer. It was still warm, a small comfort in an evening that had spiraled out of control. I changed quickly, got back into my car, and headed out again, my mind a whirlpool of thoughts and emotions. As I drove past Evans for the second time, I couldn't help but glance at the mechanic shop. It was closed now, a dark silhouette against the night sky. But something told me that it held secrets. Secrets that were intertwined with that mysterious hill. And as much as I wanted to ignore it, I knew that I was being pulled into a mystery that I couldn't easily escape. I was back on the road, uniform on, and a fresh cup of coffee in the cup holder. I'd lost time, but I was still in the game. The road stretched out before me, a winding path through the mountains that I'd come to know like the back of my hand. Except, of course, for that hill. As I approached the spot where I'd noticed it earlier, my heartbeat quickened. There it was, rising up like a dark wave against the night sky. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was out of place, like a puzzle piece jammed where it didn't belong. It was steep, lined with trees on both sides, and had a single streetlight at its base that seemed to struggle against the encroaching darkness. I slowed down as I reached the bottom of the hill. Something about it felt off like static in the air before a storm. I could see the moon in the sky, mostly full, but its light seemed to stop at the edge of the hill, as if swallowed by some unseen force. I hesitated, my foot hovering over the gas pedal. Then I shook off the feeling and started the climb. Halfway up I felt it, a strange smell that seemed to seep into the car. It was a mix of roses, cedar, and honey, but with an underlying stench of rotting meat. My stomach churned and I rolled down the window, hoping for a breath of fresh air, but the smell only intensified and I quickly rolled the window back up. I reached the top of the hill and drove on, but my mind was racing. What was that smell? Why did the hill feel so out of place? And why, for the love of God, had I never noticed it before? I was so lost in thought that I almost missed the turnoff for the mechanic shop in Evans. I pulled in, my tires crunching on the gravel. The shop was closed, but the lights were still on, casting a warm glow on the empty parking lot. I sat there for a moment, my mind a swirl of questions and half-formed theories. Then the front door of the shop creaked open, and out walked the owner, a scruffy older man with a weather-beaten face. He approached my car, and I rolled down the window. You all right? He asked, his eyes narrowing as he looked at me. Saw you turn around earlier. Everything okay? I hesitated, unsure of how much to reveal. Thought I'd forgotten something at home, I said finally. Turned out I didn't. Just heading back to work now. He stared at me for a moment, then grinned. A slow, unsettling grin that didn't reach his eyes. I saw you turn around earlier, he repeated. I'm sure whatever you left back there is better off that way. You should just keep going. A chill ran down my spine. What did he mean by that? And what did he know about the hill? I nodded mumbled a quick, thanks, and pulled out of the parking lot. But as I drove away, his words echoed in my mind, adding another layer of mystery to an already puzzling night. I was being pulled into something dark and inexplicable, and as much as I wanted to turn back, I knew I was already in too deep. I was back on the road, my mind a storm of questions and unease. The mechanic's words had added fuel to the fire of my curiosity, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. I needed answers, and I knew where to find them. That damned hill. I drove past Evans, my eyes darting to the mechanic shop as I passed. It was empty, the lights off, but I could almost feel the owner's eyes on me, watching as I drove by. I shook off the feeling and focused on the road ahead. The hill was coming up, and I needed to be ready. As I approached, my heart pounding in my chest, I saw it, the streetlight at the bottom of the hill casting its feeble glow on the asphalt. I slowed down, my eyes scanning the darkness beyond. Then I pulled over, my tires crunching on the gravel at the side of the road. I took a deep breath, bracing myself for what was to come, and stepped out of the car. 
The air was thick with that strange smell, stronger now, almost overpowering. I fought back the urge to gag and started walking, my phone's flashlight cutting through the darkness. The hill seemed steeper now, more menacing, as if it had changed since my last visit. I pushed on, my legs burning with each step, my mind racing with thoughts of what lay ahead. I was about halfway up when I heard it, a rustling in the trees, followed by a low growl that sent shivers down my spine. I froze, my flashlight trembling in my hand, and scanned the darkness. Nothing. I took a shaky breath and continued, my steps quickening as I neared the top. And then I saw it, the hut, dilapidated and crumbling, standing at the edge of the road like a sentinel. I approached cautiously, my flashlight illuminating its broken windows and rotting wood. It looked abandoned, but something told me that appearances could be deceiving. I circled around it, my eyes peeled for any sign of life, and then stepped inside. The air was stale, heavy with the smell of decay and dampness. I shone my flashlight around, revealing a small empty room with a dirt floor and walls that looked like they could collapse at any moment. But it was what was in the center of the room that caught my eye. A circle of stones, arranged in a pattern that I couldn't quite make out, surrounded by what looked like dried blood. I stared at it, my mind struggling to make sense of what I was seeing. And then it hit me. The realization that I was standing in the middle of something far darker and more dangerous than I could have ever imagined. I turned and ran, my footsteps echoing in the night, my mind screaming at me to get as far away as possible. I reached my car and fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking as I started the engine and sped away. But as I drove, my eyes glued to the rearview mirror, I knew that I had crossed a line, that I had ventured into a world that I couldn't easily escape. And as much as I wanted to forget what I had seen, to go back to my old life and pretend that none of this had ever happened, I knew that it was too late. I was in too deep, and there was no turning back. I'd been driving for what felt like hours, my mind a labyrinth of dread and confusion. The hill, the mechanic, the hut, all of it swirled in my thoughts like a dark cloud. I needed to clear my head, to make sense of what was happening. So I did what any sane person would do. I pulled into a gas station, parked at the far end of the lot, and just sat there, staring into the void. I thought about calling someone, anyone, to share the burden of what I'd discovered. But who would believe me? Hell, I barely believed it myself. I was about to start the car and head back home when my phone buzzed. A text message. Unknown number. Don't come back to the hill. You won't like what you find. My blood ran cold. Who could have sent that? The mechanic? Some other unseen watcher? I looked around, half expecting to see someone lurking in the shadows, but there was no one. Just the flickering lights of the gas station and the distant hum of the highway. I couldn't just sit there. I needed to do something, anything, to get to the bottom of this. So, I made a decision, one that I knew I might regret. I was going back to the hill, not to explore or to find answers, but to confront whatever it was that was pulling me into its web. The drive back was a blur, the road empty and the night sky devoid of stars. It was as if the world was holding its breath, waiting for what was to come. I reached the hill and parked at the bottom, my heart pounding in my chest like a drum. I took a deep breath, grabbed the flashlight, and stepped out of the car. The smell hit me immediately, stronger now, almost suffocating. I fought back the urge to vomit and started up the hill, my flashlight cutting through the darkness like a knife. I was almost at the top when I heard it, a low growl followed by the sound of footsteps, heavy footsteps coming from behind me. I turned around, my flashlight trembling in my hand, and there it was, the creature. It was massive, its body covered in pale, rotting flesh, its eyes empty sockets that seemed to stare into my soul, and on its head, a human face twisted into a grotesque smile. I was paralyzed, my mind screaming at me to run but my legs refusing to move, and then it spoke its voice a guttural growl that shook me to my core. You shouldn't have come back. I found my voice, though it was barely a whisper. What are you? It grinned, its teeth razor sharp and stained with blood. Something you can't escape. Something you'll never forget. It took a step toward me, and that's when I broke free from my paralysis. I turned and ran, my legs carrying me down the hill faster than I'd ever run before. I reached the car, fumbled with the keys and sped away, not daring to look back. As I drove, 
my mind a whirlwind of terror and disbelief. I knew that my life had changed forever. I had stared into the abyss, and the abyss had stared back. And though I didn't know what the future held, one thing was clear. I was in too deep, and there was no way out. I'd been avoiding that road, that hill, like the plague. My new route to work added an extra hour each way, but it was a small price to pay for avoiding whatever that thing was. I even started seeing a therapist to talk about the stress I was under, though I never mentioned the real reason. How could I? It was unbelievable, even to me. Days turned into weeks, and the memory of that nightmarish encounter began to fade, like the remnants of a bad dream upon waking. I almost started to believe it was all in my head, that is, until the package arrived. It was a small, unmarked box left on my doorstep. Inside was a piece of paper with a single sentence written in shaky handwriting. You can't escape what you've seen. Underneath the paper was a small object wrapped in cloth. I unwrapped it and gasped. It was a stone, one of the stones from the circle in the hut. I dropped it as if it were on fire, my heart pounding in my chest. This was impossible. How did it get here? Who sent it? My mind raced through the possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. I had to get rid of it. I grabbed the stone, wrapped it back up, and drove to the nearest river. With a sense of finality, I hurled it into the water and watched as it sank out of sight. That had to be the end of it, right? I drove back home, my nerves frayed, but my spirit lifted. Maybe now I could finally move on. But as I pulled into my driveway, my headlights illuminated something that made my blood run cold. There, sitting on my doorstep, was another box, identical to the first. I got out of the car, my legs shaky, and approached the box. I already knew what was inside, but I had to see it for myself. I opened it up and there it was, the stone back in its place, as if mocking me. But that wasn't the worst part. On the paper, a new sentence had appeared below the first. You're part of this now. I looked up, my eyes scanning the darkness, and that's when I saw it. Standing at the edge of my property, barely visible in the shadows, was the creature. It was watching me, its human-like face twisted into that same grotesque smile. And as our eyes met, I heard its voice in my head, as clear as if it were standing next to me. You can't escape. You're part of this now. I ran inside, locked all the doors, and collapsed on the floor, my body shaking uncontrollably. I knew then that there was no escape, no way out. I was part of something far darker and more terrifying than I could ever have imagined, and it was never going to let me go. As I sat there alone in the darkness, I heard a sound that made my skin crawl, a low growl coming from just outside the window. I looked up, and there it was, its face pressed against the glass, its eyes meeting mine, and as I stared into that abyss, I knew that my life, as I knew it, was over. I was part of this now, and there was no turning back. I've always been a city girl, born and bred on the East Coast, where skyscrapers touch the heavens, and the closest thing to wildlife is a stray cat darting between alleyways. But when Annette, my college roommate and lifelong friend, announced her bachelorette party would be a week-long camping trip in Yosemite National Park. I couldn't say no. Annette was always the adventurous type, the kind of woman who'd choose a hiking trail over a shopping mall any day. Think about it, Laura, she'd said, her eyes gleaming with excitement. A week under the stars, surrounded by the most breathtaking scenery you can imagine. It's going to be epic. So here I was, crammed into a rented SUV with Annette, Sarah, Emily, and Megan, driving through the heart of California. The landscape changed as we moved, from the sprawling suburbs to rolling hills, and finally to the jagged peaks of the Sierra Nevada. I felt a sense of awe creep over me, a feeling I hadn't experienced since I was a kid visiting the ocean for the first time. We reached the park in the late afternoon, the sun casting long shadows over the valley as we drove in. The first sight of Yosemite Valley was like stepping into a cathedral, a sacred place where every towering cliff and cascading waterfall felt like an altar. Even Annette, who'd seen her fair share of national parks, was speechless. We're not staying down here, she finally said, breaking the silence. Too touristy. We're heading up to the high country. 
Trust me, it's the real Yosemite experience. I glanced at Sarah, Emily, and Megan in the rearview mirror. We were all city girls, more accustomed to the concrete jungle than an actual one. But we nodded in agreement, captivated by Annette's enthusiasm. The drive up to the high country was a winding journey through narrow roads and hairpin turns. By the time we reached our campsite near the iconic Half Dome, the sun had dipped below the horizon and the first stars were appearing in the sky. We set up our tents in the fading light, each of us claiming a spot on the forest floor. Five's an odd number for tents, Annette observed. They're all two-person tents. Laura, you okay bunking alone? I hesitated for a moment, my mind flashing back to every horror movie I'd ever seen. But then I looked around at the towering redwoods, the distant peaks silhouetted against the night sky, and felt a sense of peace wash over me. Yeah, I'm good, I said, unrolling my sleeping bag inside my tent. It's not like we're really alone out here anyway. Annette laughed. That's the spirit. Just wait, Laura. This trip is going to change your life. As I zipped up my tent and settled in for the night, I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease. It was as if the forest itself was watching us, its ancient eyes hidden in the shadows. I told myself it was just my imagination, the city girl and me not used to the sounds and sights of the wilderness. But as I lay there, listening to the distant howl of a coyote and the rustling of leaves in the wind, I couldn't help but wonder what else was out there, in the dark, watching and waiting. And so began our dream vacation, a journey into the heart of one of America's most beautiful landscapes. But as I would soon discover, even the most breathtaking beauty can hide the darkest secrets. Sleep didn't come easy that first night. Every rustle of leaves, every distant animal call, seemed to reverberate through my tent like a warning. I lay there, eyes wide open, staring at the nylon ceiling as if it could offer some sort of protection. When dawn finally broke, I felt more exhausted than when I'd crawled into my sleeping bag. I unzipped my tent and stepped out into the morning light. Annette and the others were already up, gathered around the remnants of last night's campfire. Their faces were tense, eyes darting around the campsite. Morning, I mumbled, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. What's going on? Something got into our supplies, Annette said, her voice tinged with frustration. Tore right through the cloth bag and scattered food wrappers everywhere. I looked over at the hanging bear bag, still intact, swaying gently from the tree branch where we'd hoisted it. But the bear bag's fine. How's that possible? Annette shrugged. I don't know. Maybe it was a raccoon or something. Either way, we need to clean this up and report it to the park rangers. We spent the next hour picking up the scattered remnants of our food supplies. The mood was somber, the earlier excitement replaced by a sense of vulnerability. We were no longer just visitors in this wilderness. We were intruders, and something had marked its territory. After cleaning up, we made our way to the nearest ranger station to report the incident. The ranger behind the desk listened to our story with a practiced air of concern, nodding at all the right moments. Sounds like you had a run-in with a nuisance bear, he said, filling out a report. Best to move your campsite. We'll issue you a permit for a different spot. A bear? I asked, my voice tinged with disbelief. Wouldn't we have heard it? Seen it? The ranger looked up, meeting my eyes for the first time. Bears can be surprisingly stealthy, especially if they're used to human food. Don't take any chances. Move your camp. We thanked him and left, a new camping permit in hand. The drive to the new campsite was quiet, each of us lost in our thoughts. When we finally arrived and began setting up our tents again, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. It was as if the forest had eyes, and they were fixed squarely on us. Hey, you okay? Annette asked, snapping me out of my reverie. Yeah, I said, forcing a smile. Just a little on edge, I guess. Annette chuckled. You're such a city girl. This is all part of the adventure. Trust me, there's nothing out here that wants to hurt us. I wanted to believe her, I really did. But as we settled into our new campsite, the sun dipping below the horizon and casting long shadows through the trees, I couldn't escape the feeling that something was out there, lurking in the dark. And so we bedded down for another night, a thin layer of nylon the only thing separating us from the untamed wilderness beyond. But as I lay there, listening to the sounds of the night, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone, and whatever was out there, it knew we were here.
Day four rolled around, and the tension from the previous day's incident had somewhat dissipated. Annette and the girls were all set to go canoeing on a nearby lake. I opted out. My body was sore and my mind was still reeling from the unsettling events. I needed a break, a moment to breathe. I'm going to stay back and sunbathe, I told Annette as they prepared to leave. She looked at me, her eyes narrowing slightly. You sure you're okay? Yeah, I said, forcing a smile. Just need some me time, you know? Annette nodded, her face relaxing. All right, enjoy your day. We'll catch up later. I watched them leave, their laughter and chatter fading into the distance. I was alone, but it was a different kind of solitude, one I had chosen. I spread my towel on the sandy shore of the lake, put on my sunglasses, and lay down. The sun felt good on my skin, and for a moment, I forgot about the lurking fears and unsettling noises. I was lost in the beauty of the place, the way the sunlight danced on the water, the distant sound of birdsong. That's when I noticed him. A man, around my age, sunbathing a few yards away. He had a rugged look about him, with hazel eyes that seemed to sparkle in the sunlight. Our eyes met, and he smiled. Beautiful day, isn't it? He said, breaking the silence. I smiled back. It is. Absolutely perfect. He got up and walked over, extending his hand. I'm Rowan. Laura, I replied, shaking his hand. We got to talking. Rowan was from Colorado, an avid hiker and outdoorsman. He'd been coming to Yosemite every summer since he was a kid. We talked about the beauty of the park, our favorite trails, and the serenity that comes from being in nature. Somehow being out here makes all the problems of the real world seem insignificant, don't you think? He said, his eyes meeting mine. I nodded. I know what you mean. It's like an escape. Our conversation shifted to the strange occurrences at our camp. I told him about the raided food supplies, the move to a new campsite, and the unsettling feeling of being watched. Rowan's face grew serious. Sounds like a mountain lion to me. A mountain lion? I asked, my heart skipping a beat. Yeah, he said. They're elusive creatures. You'll only see one if it wants to be seen. If you can't see it, that's when you should be worried. His words sent a chill down my spine. The thought of a mountain lion stalking us was terrifying, but somehow coming from Rowan, it felt like a warning, not a threat. Be careful out here, he said, his eyes locking onto mine. Yosemite is beautiful, but it's also wild, and in the wilderness, you're never truly alone. As he spoke, I felt a strange sense of comfort. Maybe it was his confidence, or maybe it was the sincerity in his eyes. Either way, for the first time since arriving at Yosemite, I felt like maybe, just maybe, everything was going to be all right. Would you like to have dinner tonight? He asked, breaking the silence. I looked at him, my heart pounding in my chest. I'd love to, I said, and for a moment all my fears seemed to melt away. Dinner with Rowan was like a scene from a movie. We met at one of the park's restaurants, a rustic place with wooden beams and a roaring fireplace. The atmosphere was cozy, the food surprisingly good. Rowan was charming, attentive, and funny. For a few hours, I forgot about the lurking fears and unsettling events. I was just a woman on a date with a man who seemed almost too good to be true. As the evening wore on, Rowan suggested we head back to his campsite. I've got some wine back there, he said, his eyes meeting mine. What do you say? I hesitated for a moment, my mind flashing back to the warnings about mountain lions and the strange occurrences at our camp. But then I looked at Rowan, his eyes filled with warmth and sincerity, and I pushed those fears aside. Sure, I said smiling, let's go. We left the restaurant and made our way up the winding trail to his campsite. The night was clear, the sky filled with stars, and the air crisp with the scent of pine. As we walked, Rowan slipped his arm around my waist, pulling me close. It felt good, comforting. I let myself believe that maybe, just maybe, everything really was going to be all right. We reached his campsite, a secluded spot surrounded by towering trees. Rowan lit a campfire and we sat on a log, sipping wine and talking. The firelight flickered on his face, casting shadows that made him look both boyish and rugged at the same time. I'm a little cold, I said, shivering slightly. Rowan looked at me, his eyes twinkling. Would you like a sleeping bag? I nodded, standing up. I'll get it, I said, walking towards his tent. That's when I heard him. Laura, wait. I unzipped the tent and froze. There, in the sleeping bag, was a woman. Her auburn hair was spread out like a halo, her face peaceful in sleep. 
I turned, my face flushed with anger and humiliation. You have a girlfriend, and you brought me here? Rowan's face was a mask of confusion and panic. Laura, it's not what you think. She's not... I don't care, I yelled, cutting him off. I can't believe I fell for this. I turned and stormed off, my heart pounding with betrayal and rage. Rowan called after me, but I didn't look back. I just wanted to get as far away from him as possible. As I made my way through the dark forest, my mind was a whirlwind of emotion. How could I have been so stupid, so naive? But as I walked, something else began to creep into my consciousness. The sound of footsteps, soft but deliberate, echoing my own. The rustling of leaves, the snapping of twigs. The feeling of eyes on me, watching, following. I stopped, my heart in my throat. Rowan's words echoed in my mind. In the wilderness, you're never truly alone. And as I stood there, in the dark, I realized just how terrifyingly true that was. I was disoriented, my mind clouded by betrayal and the wine from dinner. But as I stood there in the dark, the reality of my situation began to sink in. I was alone, in the middle of the wilderness, and something was stalking me. I reached for my phone, fumbling in the dark. No service but the flashlight app would have to do. I turned it on, the beam cutting through the darkness, revealing nothing but trees and shadows. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my racing heart, and started to walk. That's when I heard it again. The soft, deliberate footsteps, mirroring my own. The rustling of leaves, closer now. My skin prickled with fear, my senses on high alert. I remembered Rowan's warning. A mountain lion will only be seen when it wants to be seen. I turned off my flashlight, plunging myself back into darkness, my eyes strained, trying to adjust, searching for any sign of movement. And then I saw it, a shadow, darker than the rest, moving between the trees. I felt a surge of adrenaline, my fight-or-flight instincts kicking in. I chose flight. Ignoring the voice in my head telling me not to run, I bolted, my feet pounding against the forest floor, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I didn't know where I was going didn't have a plan. All I knew was that I needed to put as much distance between me and whatever was stalking me as possible. I dodged trees, leapt over rocks, my body fueled by pure adrenaline, but I couldn't keep it up forever. My legs began to ache, my lungs burning with each breath. In a desperate bid for safety, I spotted a redwood tree with low-hanging branches and scrambled up, my hands gripping the bark, pulling myself higher and higher until I was at least ten feet off the ground. I sat there, my body trembling, my eyes scanning the forest below. I heard it before I saw it, the soft, deliberate footsteps circling the tree. And then silence. I held my breath, my body tense, waiting. Minutes passed, each one feeling like an eternity. And then just as suddenly as it had started, it was over. The footsteps moved away, fading into the distance. I waited, my body rigid until the first rays of dawn began to filter through the trees. Only then did I allow myself to climb down, my legs shaky, my entire body sore. I had no idea where I was, but I knew I needed to find my way back. Using the morning light as my guide, I started to walk. Hours passed. I was dehydrated, exhausted, and on the verge of collapse when I finally stumbled upon a trail. I followed it, each step a struggle, until I saw something that made my heart sore. A sign pointing the way to the campgrounds. I quickened my pace, my body running on fumes but fueled by the promise of safety. And then, just as I rounded a bend, I saw them, Annette and the others, their faces filled with relief and disbelief. We thought you were dead, Annette said, rushing over to hug me. I wanted to cry, to laugh, to collapse. But all I could think about was the shadow in the forest, the feeling of being hunted. And as I stood there, surrounded by friends, I realized something. I may have escaped, but I would never be free. I was back at camp, but the relief was short-lived. Annette's face was ashen, her eyes red from crying. Two uniformed officers stood nearby, their expression stern. We need to talk, one of them said, motioning for me to follow. They led me to a makeshift table where a couple of photos were laid out. The first was of Rowan, or as they called him, David Michael Whittle. The second was of a woman with auburn hair, the same woman I'd seen in the sleeping bag. Do you recognize these individuals? The officer asked. Yes, I said, my voice shaky. The man told me his name was Rowan. We had dinner last night. 
The woman was in his tent. The officer's face hardened. That woman is Alexis Fletcher, a park employee. She's been missing for a week. The man you dined with was the last person seen talking to her. We found her body this morning. She was murdered. My stomach churned, my head spinning. But I saw her in his tent. She was sleeping. The officer shook his head. She couldn't have been sleeping, ma'am. She was dead. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. I had been inches away from a murderer, from his victim. I felt sick, violated. We need to search your camp, the officer continued. This man is dangerous, and we have reason to believe he might have been stalking you. The search turned up nothing, but the damage was done. The trip was cut short, everyone too shaken to continue. We packed up, our movements robotic, our conversations strained. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, the terror that had gripped me in the forest. As we drove out of Yosemite, I looked back at the towering trees, the majestic peaks, and felt a shiver run down my spine. This place had promised an escape, a refuge. Instead, it had become a hunting ground, a place of nightmares. Weeks passed, but the fear remained. I triple-checked my locks at night, jumped at every sound. My therapist said it was PTSD, that it would take time to heal. But deep down, I knew the truth. I would never be the same. Then one night, as I was lying in bed, I heard it. A soft, deliberate footstep outside my window. My heart stopped, my body frozen in terror. I mustered the courage to look, pulling back the curtain just an inch. And there he was, standing in the moonlight. Rowan, or David, or whatever his name was. His eyes met mine and he smiled. That same charming smile that had once made me feel special. As I reached for my phone to call 911, I noticed something in his hand. It was a photo, the same one the police had shown me. Only this time it wasn't just Alexis in the picture. It was me, standing next to her, both of us smiling, unaware. My scream was swallowed by the night, a chilling realization settling in. I had escaped, but he had found me, and in that moment, I knew. The hunt was far from over. I've always had a knack for finding trouble, or maybe trouble has a way of finding me. Either way, when I told my folks about the camping trip to Kosia National Park, their faces turned a shade paler. Romania isn't exactly the poster child for safety, and they knew it. My mom's eyes narrowed, a sure sign she was about to launch into one of her cautionary tales. Romania, you know people disappear there, right? Kidnapped, murdered, who knows what else, she said her voice tinged with that maternal worry I'd come to know so well. My dad chimed in. Your mother's right. Why can't you pick a safer place? Somewhere without a reputation for, well, you know. I had my counter-argument ready. We're staying in a hotel, okay? Right near the park. It's a tourist area. What could go wrong? The lie slid off my tongue easier than I'd like to admit. A hotel stay was far from our rugged back-to-nature plan but it was the only way to get them off my back. They exchanged glances, and I could see the gears turning in their heads, weighing the odds. Finally, they nodded, their faces still etched with concern. All right, but promise you'll be careful, my mom said, her eyes searching mine for sincerity. I promise, I replied, crossing my fingers behind my back. Two days later, my boyfriend and I were on a train departing from Bucharest our backpacks stuffed with everything we'd need for a four-day adventure in the wilderness. The train was a relic, its compartments worn and tired, but it was our ticket to freedom. As we settled into our compartment, I couldn't help but feel a sense of elation. The compartment was empty, a rare luxury on Romanian trains. I looked at my boyfriend, his eyes mirroring my excitement. Looks like we've got the place to ourselves, I said, stretching my legs out. He grinned. Yeah, let's enjoy it while it lasts. We both knew the solitude wouldn't last long. Romanian trains are notorious for being overcrowded. But for those first few minutes, it felt like the universe was giving us a break, a small pocket of peace before whatever awaited us at Cozia National Park. As the train chugged along, the landscape outside the window shifted from the urban sprawl of Bucharest to the rolling hills and dense forests that make up much of Romania's countryside. I felt a sense of anticipation building within me, each mile taking us closer to the unknown. And then, just when I'd started to think we'd won the lottery with our empty compartment, 
The door slid open. A man stepped in, followed by a German shepherd that looked more like a wolf than a dog. My heart sank a little, but I had no idea just how much that encounter would change everything. As the door closed behind them, sealing us in with our new companions, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were on the edge of something, a precipice beyond which lay things I couldn't yet see or understand. And whether it was the thrill of adventure or a premonition of dangers to come, I knew one thing for sure. This trip was going to be anything but ordinary. The door slid shut with a finality that made my stomach churn. The man who just entered was tall, his face unreadable, framed by a curtain of dark hair. His eyes, however, were what caught my attention, cold, calculating, as if sizing us up. The German shepherd at his side was equally unsettling, its eyes almost human in their intelligence. Mind if we join you? The man's voice was smooth, almost too smooth, like river stones worn down by years of flowing water. Of course not, I replied, forcing a smile. It's a public train after all. He nodded and took the seat across from us, his dog obediently settling at his feet. There was something about that dog, a stillness, an intensity, that made me uneasy. What's his name? I asked, nodding toward the dog, trying to break the ice. Yuchi Gashul, he said, his eyes never leaving mine. The killer? I translated, my eyes widening. That's an unusual name for a dog. He's trained to kill. It's what he's good at, the man replied, his voice devoid of emotion. I glanced at my boyfriend, who shot me a look that clearly said, Let's not go there. I took the hint. So, you're familiar with Kosha National Park? I ventured, steering the conversation toward safer ground. The man's eyes lit up, a spark of enthusiasm breaking through his otherwise stoic demeanor. Ah, yes, beautiful place. You should visit the monastery at the base of the mountain. And don't miss the Latery Shore, a waterfall with a cave behind it. There's also a local restaurant you might want to try. His sudden chattiness was disconcerting, but also a relief. Maybe he was just a nature enthusiast, I thought, trying to reassure myself. Thanks for the tips, I said, genuinely grateful for the information. We're new to the area, so any advice is welcome. He nodded, seemingly satisfied, and then fell silent. The rest of the journey passed in an uncomfortable quiet, punctuated only by the rhythmic clatter of the train on the tracks. I found myself counting the minutes, eager to reach our destination and put some distance between us and our unsettling travel companion. Finally, the train began to slow, the scenery outside the window coalescing into the recognizable shapes of buildings and roads. We had arrived. I felt a sense of relief wash over me, as if I'd been holding my breath and could finally exhale. We're here, I said, looking at my boyfriend, then back at the man and his dog. It was nice meeting you. The man nodded, his eyes unreadable once again. Enjoy your stay, he said, his voice tinged with something I couldn't quite place. Was it a warning, a threat, or just my imagination running wild? As we grabbed our backpacks and stepped off the train, I took one last look back. The man and his dog were gone, vanished as if they'd never been there at all. It was as if the universe had swallowed them whole, leaving me to wonder if they were ever real to begin with. And yet, as we made our way toward Kosha National Park, I couldn't shake the feeling that our paths would cross again. And next time, I feared, the stakes might be much higher. The train station was a blur of activity, a hive of travelers and locals, each absorbed in their own world. We stepped off the platform, our backpacks heavy but our spirits light. The mysterious man and his dog were behind us, or so I hoped. Now it was just us in the wilderness, a blank canvas waiting to be painted with our adventures. We started our trek toward Kosha National Park, the map in my boyfriend's hand our only guide. The landscape was breathtaking, rolling hills giving way to dense forests, the air tinged with the earthy scent of pine and damp soil. It was a different world, far removed from the hustle and bustle of Bucharest, and I felt a sense of freedom I hadn't felt in years. That's when we heard it, a soft whimper, a cry of distress that seemed to echo through the trees. My boyfriend looked at me, his eyes saying, don't even think about it. But I was already moving toward the sound, my instincts overriding any sense of caution. And there he was, a chubby puppy, his fur a patchwork of white and brown, lying in the middle of the road as if he'd given up on life. His eyes met mine, and in that moment, I knew our trip had just taken an unexpected turn. 
We can't leave him, I said, already scooping the puppy into my arms. My boyfriend sighed, a mixture of resignation and affection. What are we going to call him? Rudolph, I said, looking into the puppy's eyes. He looks like a Rudolph. Just when we thought our adventure had reached its quota of surprises, we heard another whimper, this one softer, more desperate. Following the sound, we found another puppy, probably Rudolph's sister, half submerged in a nearby river. Someone had tried to drown her, a thought that made my blood boil. We're taking her too, I said, my voice leaving no room for argument. And so, we became a party of four, two humans and two puppies, each with a story to tell. We continued our trek, our new companions adding a layer of complexity, but also a sense of purpose to our journey. As we walked, we came upon the monastery the man on the train had mentioned. It was an imposing structure, its stone walls weathered by time, a testament to faith and endurance. We wanted to go in, but the stern look from the priest told us that our four-legged friends were not welcome. Let's keep moving, my boyfriend said, his eyes scanning the map. We circled the monastery, taking in its gardens and the sense of peace that seemed to permeate the air. Soon, we reached the base of the mountain, the first leg of our journey complete. That's when we saw it, the Three Anitza, a small religious landmark tucked away in the woods. It was a simple structure, a roof and four walls, but inside was an icon and a Bible. I picked up the Bible, its pages torn and weathered, and saw the words that sent a chill down my spine. I will find you. I looked at my boyfriend, then back at our two puppies. We were a long way from home, in a land of beauty and mystery, and I couldn't shake the feeling that our adventure was just beginning. But as I closed the Bible and we resumed our trek, I also knew one thing. We weren't alone. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows that danced and flickered in the dying light. We had set up camp near the Three Anitza, its religious icon and that haunting Bible now a stone's throw away. I tried to shake off the unease that clung to me like a second skin, but it was easier said than done. We should get the fire going, my boyfriend said, breaking the silence that had settled over us. I nodded, my thoughts still on the words I'd read in that Bible. I will find you. Who had written them? And why? Questions swirled in my mind, each unanswered, each adding a layer of complexity to an already puzzling situation. As the first flames of our campfire flickered to life, casting a warm glow on our makeshift home, I felt a momentary sense of relief. Fire has a way of doing that, pushing back the darkness, both literal and metaphorical. But that relief was short-lived. A guttural grunt echoed through the forest, a sound so out of place it made my heart skip a beat. My boyfriend and I locked eyes, a silent communication that needed no words. Something was out there, watching us, studying us. Did you hear that? I whispered, my voice barely rising above the crackling of the fire. He nodded, his hand inching toward the pocket knife he always carried. Stay close, he said, his eyes scanning the darkness beyond the firelight. And then we saw it, a slithery figure, its form barely discernible, darting between the trees. It moved with a speed that seemed unnatural, its outline blurring and shifting as if not entirely of this world. What the hell was that? My boyfriend muttered, his voice tinged with disbelief. I don't know, I replied, my mind racing, but it's gone now. We both knew that was wishful thinking. Whatever it was, it was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to reveal itself. As if on cue, the fire let out a series of sparks each one soaring into the night sky before disappearing into the forest. But something was off. The sparks didn't fade away like they should have. Instead, they seemed to hang in the air, their glow intensifying, changing color from a hellish red to an eerie green. Are you seeing this? I asked, my eyes fixed on the spectacle unfolding before us. My boyfriend nodded, his face a mask of confusion and awe. I've never seen anything like it. It was as if the fire was beckoning us, urging us to venture deeper into the forest, into the heart of the unknown, and for a moment I was tempted, tempted to follow the sparks, to unravel the mystery that had ensnared us from the moment we'd stepped off that train. But then I looked at the trees surrounding our camp, their trunks marked by shapes that looked eerily like eyes, hundreds of them, all staring at us, all watching our every move. We're not alone, 
I whispered, my voice tinged with a fear I couldn't quite shake. My boyfriend took my hand, his grip firm and reassuring. No, we're not, he said, his eyes meeting mine. But whatever's out there, we'll face it together. And as the fire continued its ghostly dance, casting shadows that seemed to come alive in the darkness, I knew he was right. We would face it, whatever it was, and come what may. But as the night stretched on, each minute an eternity, I couldn't help but wonder, what were we up against, and would we make it through the night? The fire had dwindled to embers, its once vibrant flames now reduced to a soft glow. My boyfriend had dozed off, his breathing steady, a counterpoint to the erratic rhythm of my own heart. The puppies, Rudolph and his sister, were curled up beside him, their tiny bodies rising and falling in sync with his breaths. I should have felt comforted, but I didn't. The night was too still, too quiet, as if holding its breath in anticipation. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes, a sound so soft it could have been the wind. But I knew better. My eyes darted to the spot, my body tensing, every instinct screaming at me to run, to hide, to do something. But I was paralyzed, caught in the grip of a fear so primal it defied logic. I nudged my boyfriend awake, my fingers trembling as they touched his arm. Listen, I whispered, my voice barely audible. He stirred, his eyes meeting mine, and in that instant he knew. Something was out there, something that didn't belong, something that had no place in the natural order of things. We both peered through a small opening in the tent, our eyes straining to make sense of the darkness. And then we saw it, a human head, emerging from the very bush that had caught my attention. Slowly, almost painfully, the figure revealed itself, its body lit by the moon and the dying embers of our fire. It was him, the man from the train, his face twisted into a grotesque mask, his eyes devoid of humanity, and he was naked, his body exposed as if daring us to look, to bear witness to his madness. My heart was pounding, each beat a drum roll in my ears, drowning out all other sounds. The man moved closer to our fire, his hands reaching down to pick up branches and rocks, methodically dismantling the very thing that had given us a semblance of security. And then, as if satisfied with his work, he retreated, his body disappearing into the bush, swallowed by the darkness. I looked at my boyfriend, my eyes wide with disbelief. Did that just happen? I asked, my voice shaky. He nodded, his face pale, his eyes haunted. It did and we need to do something about it. We unzipped the tent, our movements cautious, deliberate. The fire was out, its embers cold, its warmth a distant memory. We gathered more wood, our hands working in unison, each piece a building block in our fortress against the unknown. As the fire roared back to life, its flames licking the night sky, I felt a sense of defiance wash over me. We were still here, still standing, still fighting. But as I looked into the flames, their dance a mesmerizing blend of light and shadow, I knew we weren't out of the woods yet, literally and figuratively. We'll stay awake, my boyfriend said, his voice tinged with resolve. We'll keep this fire going and we'll make it through the night. I nodded, my eyes meeting his, and in that moment, I knew we would. We had to, because whatever was out there, whatever had visited us on this godforsaken night, it wasn't done with us yet. And as the fire cast its glow on our faces, revealing but also concealing, I couldn't help but wonder, what would the dawn bring? And were we ready to face it? The first rays of dawn should have been a relief, a promise of a new day, and an end to the night's terrors. But the sky remained dark, as if the sun itself had forsaken this patch of Romanian wilderness. The fire was our only source of light, its flames now more necessity than comfort. We should have seen daylight by now, my boyfriend said, his voice tinged with an unease that mirrored my own. I nodded, my eyes scanning the horizon for any sign of morning's approach. But there was nothing, just an endless expanse of darkness that seemed to stretch on forever. That's not possible, I whispered, my voice barely rising above the crackling of the fire. The sun has to rise. It's just how it works. He looked at me, his eyes filled with a fear that needed no words. Maybe we're not where we think we are, he said, his voice heavy with implication. Before I could respond, a sound pierced the air, a howl, guttural and primal, 
echoing through the trees like a death knell. It was answered by another, and then another, a chorus of voices that seemed to come from all directions at once. They're closing in, my boyfriend said, his hand gripping the pocket knife as if it could ward off the impending doom. The puppies, Rudolph and his sister, were awake now, their eyes wide, their bodies trembling. They seemed to sense the danger, their instincts a warning we couldn't ignore. And then, as if on cue, the figures emerged from the forest, their forms barely visible in the firelight. Wolves, at least half a dozen, their eyes glowing an unnatural red, their snouts pulled back in a snarl. But there was something off about them, something that defied explanation. They moved in unison, their steps perfectly synchronized, as if controlled by a single malevolent will. We need to go now, my boyfriend said, his voice tinged with desperation. I nodded, my body already in motion, my mind racing through scenarios, each more terrifying than the last. We grabbed the puppies, their tiny forms pressed against our chests, and made a run for it, our feet pounding the earth in a frantic rhythm. But we didn't get far. A figure stepped into our path, his form illuminated by the dying embers of our fire. It was the man from the train, his eyes now a glowing red that matched those of the wolves, his grin a grotesque parody of human emotion. You can't run from what's in you, he said, his voice a low growl that seemed to come from the very depths of the earth. And as the wolves closed in, their eyes fixed on us, their snouts dripping with anticipation, I realized the horrifying truth. We were never meant to leave this place, this patch of wilderness that existed outside of time, outside of reality. We were part of it now, part of its eternal darkness, its insatiable hunger. As the first set of jaws closed around my arm, its bite a searing pain that shot through my body, I let out a scream that seemed to echo through the ages, a final, desperate cry that went unanswered. Because in that moment, as the darkness closed in, I knew there would be no dawn, no escape, no end to the nightmare that had claimed us. And as my vision blurred, the last thing I saw was the man from the train, his eyes glowing brighter than ever, his grin widening in triumph. I have a habit of daydreaming, not the kind where you're half listening to a teacher drone on about algebra while you're mentally on a beach somewhere. No, I'm talking about daydreams so vivid you can smell the salt in the air, feel the sand between your toes, and hear the waves crashing. It's a gift and a curse, really. A gift because it makes long road trips bearable, and a curse because sometimes the line between what's in my head and what's real gets a little too blurry for comfort. We were packed into our new RV, a hulking beast of a vehicle that my dad was still figuring out how to maneuver. Best investment I ever made, he declared, gripping the wheel like he was wrestling an alligator. Mom was in the passenger seat, her eyes scanning the road ahead, probably contemplating the wisdom of letting Dad drive this monstrosity. I was in the back, my younger sister next to me, her nose buried in some teen romance novel. Florida, here we come, Dad announced, his voice tinged with that kind of forced enthusiasm parents muster when they're trying to make something sound more fun than it actually is. We'd been driving for hours, the landscape outside shifting from the familiar to the increasingly foreign. The sky was a dull gray, the kind that makes you forget the sun ever existed. But we were heading south, towards warmth and sunshine, and that was enough to keep everyone's spirits up. Eventually, we pulled into a rest stop near Lake City. The place was a hive of activity, buzzing with travelers, truckers, and families with screaming kids. All right, everyone out, Dad said, parking the RV with a finality that suggested he was glad to be done with driving, even if it was just for a little while. I stepped out and stretched, my muscles aching from hours of sitting. The air smelled like gasoline and fast food, a combination that was oddly comforting. I made my way to the vending machines, my eyes scanning the options. Just as I was about to make my selection, a man sidled up next to me. He was middle-aged but fit, his skin tanned to a shade that suggested he spent a lot of time outdoors. I like those Snickers bars the best. Leave me a couple, would you? He said, flashing a grin that was all teeth. Sure, I replied, making small talk as I punched in the numbers on the vending machine. His name was Alex, he told me, a businessman from Arizona. Everyone needs a vacation, 
he said, waving away my questions about what brought him to Florida. Something about the way he looked at me made my skin crawl. It was like he was sizing me up, cataloging details for some purpose I couldn't fathom. I felt like a specimen under a microscope, and I didn't like it one bit. Time to go. Mom's voice cut through the air, pulling me out of my thoughts. Nice meeting you, I said, taking a step back from Alex. The pleasure was all mine, he replied, his eyes locking onto mine for a moment too long. As I walked back to the RV, a shiver ran down my spine. Something about that encounter felt off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Shaking off the uneasy feeling, I climbed back into the RV. Little did I know that wouldn't be the last I'd see of Alex, and the line between my vivid daydreams and reality was about to get a whole lot blurrier. The RV rumbled into the campground, a patchwork of tents, trailers, and outdoor enthusiasts trying to escape the grind. Dad backed the behemoth into our rented lot with the precision of a surgeon, or at least he liked to think so. Like a glove, he announced, stepping out of the driver's seat as if he'd just landed a plane. Mom was already flipping through a campground brochure, her eyes darting over the activities listed. There's a nature trail that leads to a conservation area, she said, looking up. We should explore it. I was already ahead of her, my new digital camera in hand. I was thinking the same thing, I said, eager to capture the raw beauty of Florida's wilderness. My sister rolled her eyes, more interested in the campground's Wi-Fi password than the great outdoors. We're coming too, Dad declared, pulling out a pair of binoculars from an overhead compartment. Can't let you have all the fun? I hid my disappointment. I'd been looking forward to some alone time, maybe even sneaking off to smoke a bowl or two. But with my parents tagging along, that plan was as good as dead. We set off on the trail, a narrow path that wound through towering trees and thick underbrush. The air was heavy with the scent of damp earth and decaying leaves, a smell I found oddly comforting. Birds sang from hidden perches, their melodies filling the air. Dad was in full explorer mode, his binoculars pressed to his eyes as he scanned the treetops for exotic birds. Mom was a few steps ahead, her pace brisk, her eyes set on the path ahead. I lagged behind, my camera ready, waiting for the perfect shot. We reached a fork in the trail, a wooden sign pointing the way to the conservation area. This way, Mom said, leading us down the path. As we walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. My eyes darted from tree to tree, half expecting to see Alex lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing, just the rustling of leaves and the distant sound of a creek. We reached the conservation area, a sprawling expanse of wetlands that stretched as far as the eye could see. Wow, I breathed, lifting my camera to capture the scene. Beautiful, isn't it? Mom said, her eyes taking in the view. It's something, Dad agreed, lowering his binoculars. I snapped a few photos, my finger pressing the shutter as I tried to capture the essence of the place. It was wild, untamed, a slice of Florida that had somehow escaped the relentless march of progress. As I looked through the lens, my mind began to drift. I imagined the people who had once called this place home, their lives intertwined with the land in ways I could barely comprehend. It was a daydream I knew, but it felt real, almost tangible. And then, just as I was about to lose myself in the fantasy, I heard it, a voice calling out from the trail behind us. I lowered my camera, my heart sinking as I turned to see who it was. It was a voice I recognized, a voice I'd hoped I'd never hear again. And as I stood there, my camera hanging limply from my neck, I knew that the line between my daydreams and reality was about to be shattered. We were on a footbridge that spanned a murky stretch of swamp water, the wooden planks creaking under our weight. Dad was squinting at a map, trying to figure out where we were, while Mom was busy snapping photos of a heron in the distance. I was leaning on the railing, my eyes scanning the water below for any sign of alligators. Look at this, Dad said, pointing to a spot on the map. There's a lookout tower not far from here. We should check it out. Before I could respond, a movement in the water caught my eye. A ripple, then a flash of scales, and for a brief moment I saw it. An alligator, lurking just below the surface. Holy moly, that's a big one, Dad exclaimed, following my gaze. I raised my camera, but the creature had already vanished, leaving only a trail of bubbles in its wake. Missed it, I muttered, lowering the camera in disappointment. Just then, I heard footsteps approaching, 
I turned and felt my blood run cold. It was him, Alex, the man from the rest stop. He was talking to a park ranger, a woman who looked utterly captivated by whatever he was saying. Come on, kiddo, mom said, tugging at my arm. Let's go get eaten alive in this dirty damn swamp. I let her pull me away, but my eyes stayed on Alex. He was watching me, his gaze unsettlingly intense. As we walked off, I saw him say something to the park ranger, who then handed him a red hairband she'd been wearing. The moment we were out of earshot, I turned to my parents. I think we should head back, I said, my voice tinged with urgency. Why, we're just getting started, Dad protested. I don't feel well, I lied, hoping they'd take the bait. Mom looked at me, her eyes narrowing. You're not trying to sneak off and smoke that stuff again, are you? No, Mom, I swear, I just don't feel good. She sighed, her face softening. All right, let's head back. As we retraced our steps, I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible was about to happen. My mind kept drifting back to Alex, to the way he'd looked at me, to the red hairband he'd taken from the park ranger. It all felt wrong, like pieces of a puzzle I couldn't quite put together. We reached the RV and I practically sprinted inside, locking the door behind me. My parents exchanged puzzled glances but didn't say anything. I collapsed on the couch, my heart pounding in my chest. For a moment I considered telling them about Alex, about the unsettling feeling he gave me, but then I thought better of it. They'd think I was paranoid, overreacting, so I kept it to myself, hoping I was wrong, hoping it was all just a figment of my overactive imagination, but deep down, I knew it wasn't. Something was off, something I couldn't quite put my finger on, and as I sat there, staring out the window at the fading light, I had the sinking feeling that our trip to Florida had just taken a dark and dangerous turn. The next morning, I woke up with a sense of dread hanging over me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, that we were in danger. I tried to push the thought out of my mind as I stepped out of the RV, the Florida sun already beating down. Morning, sleepyhead, Mom greeted, flipping pancakes on a portable grill. Want some breakfast? I forced a smile. Sure, thanks. As I sat down to eat, my eyes scanned the campground. Families were out and about, kids riding bikes, parents setting up lawn chairs. Everything seemed normal, but the feeling of unease wouldn't go away. We're going to the beach today, Dad announced, sipping his coffee. You coming? I hesitated. The thought of being out in the open made me nervous, but staying behind alone seemed even worse. Yeah, I'll come, I finally said. We packed up and headed to the beach, a short drive from the campground. As we spread out our towels and set up our umbrella, I couldn't help but feel like we were being watched. I looked around, half expecting to see Alex lurking nearby, but there was no sign of him. Let's hit the water, Dad suggested, already in his swim trunks. I followed him to the shoreline, the waves crashing at our feet. For a moment, I forgot about my worries, lost in the simple joy of the ocean, but then, as I was wading into the water, I saw him. Alex was standing on the beach, not far from where we'd set up. He was staring at me, his eyes cold and calculating. A shiver ran down my spine. I turned and hurried back to our spot. We need to go, I told my parents, my voice tinged with panic. What's wrong? Mom asked, concerned. I just saw that guy from the rest stop, Alex. He's here and he's watching us. Dad looked skeptical. Are you sure it's him? I'm positive. We can't just pack up because you're feeling paranoid, Dad argued. I'm not being paranoid, I insisted. Something's not right about that guy. We need to leave now. Mom looked at Dad, her eyes filled with worry. Maybe we should go, she said softly. Dad sighed, clearly frustrated. Fine, let's pack up. As we hurriedly gathered our things, I kept an eye on Alex. He was still there watching us. And as we headed back to the car, I saw him pull out his phone and make a call. The drive back to the campground was tense, no one speaking. As we pulled in, I noticed a police car parked near the entrance. My heart sank. We need to talk to them, I said, pointing to the police car. Dad nodded. All right, let's see what they have to say. As we approached the officers, I felt a mix of relief and dread. Maybe they could help us, or maybe we were already too late. But as I looked back at the campground, at the people going about their day, Oblivious to the danger lurking among them, I knew we had to try. We approached the police officers, their uniforms crisp and their faces stern. Dad took the lead, explaining that we'd seen someone suspicious, 
someone we'd encountered before. Alex, I added, from Arizona. He's been following us. The officers exchanged glances. We've had a report of a missing park ranger, one of them said. You think this Alex is involved? I can't say for sure, Dad replied, but something about him doesn't sit right. The officers took down our information and promised to look into it. As we walked back to the RV, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were running out of time. We should leave, I said, my voice urgent. We should pack up and go now. Dad hesitated, looking at Mom. What do you think? I think our son is scared, she said softly, and that scares me. We started packing, throwing our things into the RV with a sense of urgency. I kept looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see Alex at any moment, but he was nowhere to be seen, and that somehow made it worse. Finally, we were ready to go. Dad started the engine, and I felt a wave of relief wash over me. Maybe we'd dodged a bullet. Maybe we were going to be okay. And then I saw her, the park ranger who'd been talking to Alex. She was standing at the edge of the campground, her eyes vacant, her face expressionless. And she was holding something in her hand, a red hairband. My heart stopped. Dad, wait. He slammed on the brakes, looking at me in confusion. What is it? Her, I said, pointing to the ranger. She's not herself. Alex did something to her. Dad looked at the ranger, then back at me. You can't know that. I do, I insisted. I can feel it. Suddenly the ranger moved, her hand reaching up to touch the hairband. And then, in a voice that was not her own, she spoke. I could have taught you, she said, her voice dripping with malice. But you chose to run. A bad choice. My blood ran cold. It was Alex's voice coming from her mouth. He'd taken her over just like he'd said he could. Dad floored the accelerator and we sped away, leaving the possessed ranger standing alone. No one spoke for a long time, each of us lost in our own thoughts, our own fears. Finally, Dad broke the silence. What was that? What the hell just happened? I looked at him, my eyes filled with tears. I think we just escaped something terrible, something evil. He nodded, his face pale. I think you're right. As we drove, I couldn't help but wonder what would have happened if we'd stayed, if we'd ignored that feeling of dread. And as I looked out the window, watching the Florida landscape speed by, I knew one thing for certain, we were lucky to be alive. But I also knew that Alex was still out there, and that thought filled me with a dread I couldn't shake. We drove for hours, the tension in the RV as thick as the humid Florida air outside. No one wanted to talk about what had happened, as if speaking it aloud would make it more real, more terrifying than it already was. But the silence was its own kind of horror, each of us alone with our thoughts, our fears. Finally, we crossed the state line, leaving Florida behind. I felt a small sense of relief, as if we'd put a physical distance between us and the evil we'd encountered. But I knew it wasn't that simple. Whatever Alex, or the thing that had been Alex, was, it wasn't confined to one place, one state. It was something older, darker, something that couldn't be outrun. We stopped at a rest area, the first we'd seen in miles. I need to stretch my legs, Dad said, his voice shaky. Anyone else coming? I'll stay here, Mom replied, her eyes never leaving the road ahead, as if she could see something we couldn't. I got out of the RV, my legs stiff, my body aching. I walked around the rest area, my eyes scanning the faces of the other travelers. Were they who they appeared to be? Or were they like Alex, something else wearing a human face? As I was about to head back to the RV, my phone buzzed in my pocket. A text message. I pulled it out, my hands trembling as I read the words on the screen. I'm disappointed in you, it read. We could have had so much fun together. It was from an unknown number, but I knew who it was from. My heart pounding, I looked around half expecting to see Alex standing there, watching me. But there was no one, just families on their way to vacations, truckers on long hauls, people living their lives, unaware of the darkness that lurked among them. I got back in the RV, my hands shaking as I showed the text to my parents. We need to go to the police, Dad said, his voice tinged with fear. We need to tell them everything. And then what? I asked, my voice hollow. Do you think they'll believe us? Do you think they can stop him? Dad didn't answer, and he didn't need to. We both knew the truth. There was no stopping Alex, no escaping him. He was out there, somewhere, 
and he would find us, no matter where we went, no matter what we did. As we got back on the road, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that we were never truly alone, and as I looked out the window, at the endless road stretching out before us, I knew that we were heading into a darkness far deeper than the night, a darkness that would never end. And somewhere, out there in that endless dark, Alex was waiting. <laughs>